Thank you, Emmett. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Stamp, and I'm the director of state and local taxes for GBQ Partners. Uh, GBQ Partners is pleased to sponsor today's program uh, and support the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the complete biography for each speaker is in your forum program, so I'll just pro uh, provide brief introductions. Our first speaker is the director of public policy for the Center for Community Solutions. Please welcome John Honick. Our next speaker is the State House Liaison and Policy Analyst at the Buckeye Institute. Please welcome Greg Lawson. <laughs> Moderating the forum this afternoon is an OSU professor with the Fisher, Fisher College of Business, specializing in tax, nonprofit organizations, and financial planning. Please welcome William Robbie. Um, <laughs> On behalf of CMC and GBQ Partners, welcome to all of our panelists, and uh, Bill, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Well, I'm always happy to talk about tax with anybody that I can find, and in an election year, you, you almost can't help it. I mean, it's been in the headlines for months already, and we're probably not done with it. I was listening to something this morning. It said, well, the fiscal cliff is five weeks away from a final decision. We'll be lucky if it's five weeks, but five weeks sure seems like a long time after a long election period. But uh, with, with terms like fiscal cliff and tax expenditures and tax loopholes, I think it's good that we spend some time looking at these uh, now. We, we look at the tax climate at the state level in Ohio, and I think our ranking is getting better with the repeal of a corporate income tax and cutbacks on the individual income tax and maybe more coming. Uh, we're getting better, but the state and local, uh, the, the local and city and municipal level of the tax still is the one that we look the worst on, that, that relative to our neighbors and relative to the rest of the country. Everybody except, I think, the city of Columbus uh, is still looking for revenue. They seem to have, have enough right now. And so the, the number of local tax returns and dollars that we have to pay is what brings our ratings down. Uh, in any event, at the federal or the state level, it's clear that the tax system is not giving enough money to pay for the goodies that we want it to pay for. And so there's several ways to do that. We can either cut back on spending, or we can raise some taxes, or we could do both. And one sort of hidden way to do that is to look at what people call tax loopholes, or what tax junkies like me call tax expenditures, and uh, review what's there, see if there's something we can do better, more of, less of, because that's sort of a shadow budget of maybe 25% of the entire operating budget at both state, local, and federal levels. So a tax loophole is something that somebody else gets, apparently, and that you want to get your hands on. And so the more uh, neutral term would be a tax expenditure, which is a legal provision that the legislature, the Congress, has adopted it. We are not evading tax. This is not fraud or cheating. But what we are doing by using the tax expenditure is removing revenue from the government. It's a loss to the government that they have purposely written into the law and that we as taxpayers are making use of. There's an and between those, and sometimes we have provisions that we don't know about or can't use. A tax expenditure is not really an expenditure. It's not an appropriation type item. Nobody votes on this as a cut the check thing. It's a provision that goes through the tax system because taxes affect every person living and corporate and partnership and exempt every day, every week, every quarter. And so the access to us and our information makes the tax system an easy way to put provisions like this into place. Uh, usually, we would do things like this through the appropriations process, but a tax expenditure is either there by history, by inertia, or for maybe some other reasons. For instance, uh, uh, the people in the legislature didn't think they could get a public vote of 51 or 60 or 67 percent on a provision that's this narrow or maybe targeted to uh, a couple of parties or another. So they did it the other way, and they did it by putting a tax break in. Uh, they didn't want to go to a full spending or a grant program because that would entail additional bureaucracies. It would entail hearings and time and transparency that may be a strength or a weakness. Or it could be it's just not all that popular of an issue. If you want to give a tax cut to corporations, I bet you can't get that through many legislatures. 
but instead, if you put in a credit or a tax deduction or an exclusion that then those same corporations can use, effectively you're cutting their tax rate, but it never came to that kind of a vote and no one ever seemed to, to, to figure it out. Uh, tax expenditures of this sort seem to be especially uh, burdened by political measures. Hey, I'm a good guy, vote for me again. I'll give you a deduction for a, a tall, white, glasses-wearing, right-handed tax professor. I'm, I'm going to vote for that person. And so how many of those can we burden the tax code with? Uh, but also, lobbyists who come in and say, uh, this would be good for my industry, let's see if we can get that through, those often look more like tax expenditures than actual spending bills. So is a tax expenditure or a loophole a tax cut for the party who uses it, or is it a spending program that the legislature has put in place and just calls it something else? So I, th I think the answer is yes, it's both. And so that means it needs our attention and needs regular review as we go. Tax expenditures tend to take different types. One of them would be to leave a tax in place but defer it to later times. It's always good to pay taxes later than sooner. Something like a depreciation deduction looks like that. The more depreciation, the faster you get it, the less tax you have to pay up front. A tax expenditure might be in the form of forgiveness of a tax, just outright, instead of a rate cut, which might be hard to get. Uh, we'll give you a credit for every child that you have under age 16. Or it might be in the form of a promise or a contract. That is, if you bring so many jobs to our suburb, we'll allow you to build a building and not charge you property tax on it. It has to be so many jobs and we'll check on you every six months. And if you fail our test, you give the credit back. And so that's a tax expenditure, certainly while it's granted, but that one has a leash on it and says uh, there are obligations that the taxpayer has to, has to include um, uh, after the credit is granted. Uh, the tax effects of tax expenditures depend on what form it takes. A deduction or an exclusion depends upon what bracket you're in. If you're in a higher bracket than me, the deduction is worth more to you than it is to me. Some, uh, for individual taxpayers, deductions are only available if you itemize. Uh, for two-thirds of all taxpayers, that means you don't get that deduction because only essentially homeowners itemize and would have that deduction available to them. About 80% of tax expenditures, loopholes are in the form of deductions. The other 20% are in the form of tax credits, and so those would be maybe one-time, limited-time incentives to invest in a certain or to stop investing uh, in certain activities. Sometimes the credit is refundable and everybody gets it no matter what bracket they're in. More likely, especially with business credits, they're not refundable, but you can carry them back or forward to other tax years. Tax expenditures don't necessarily help the 47% of individuals who don't pay taxes at all. How can you cut that? Well, you can if you give a refundable credit, that is something like the earned income credit going to lower income people, they get money back from the government more than they had put in. And so the, the form that the tax expenditure or loophole takes really does affect who's the target, who, it, who it's aimed at, who gets to use it, and who doesn't. And those all have to come in in a legislative review or some other sort of a review that those um, expenditures should get. Let's say that you look at this and say, gee, 25% of the budget in sort of a shadow apportionment format, Let, let's cut those expenditures back. You hear them talking like that in Washington right now about taking away or capping itemized deductions for things like mortgage interest. Um, what would happen if that would be true? Well, that would be a tax increase. You can't see it any other way. If you were using that tax loophole and it gets taken away, that's a tax increase for you. It might not be for the other people who aren't using it. And you can see how politics plays in on that one too. But you could also see the repeal of tax expenditures as a way to remove distortions in the tax law that these things bring about. For instance, let's say that there's a business credit that you get for every new worker that you hire. All right, well, that's wonderful, and get, that gets headlines and so on. But the more that you think about that credit and hire new people, the less money you have to spend then on acquiring new tech equipment, or on a new fleet of trucks, or on updating your communications equipment. So it distorts the decision that you make, like all tax provisions do. And I think the less we depend on tax expenditures like that, the better off we are. 
And the closer we move to a broad-based, flat, maybe one or two rate tax system that I think would be best for all of us. Low rate, broad base, uh, will help us bring business here, keep the business that we have. Uh, and in that way, uh, weaning ourselves off of expenditures like this, closing loopholes, uh, seems to be the right direction to go. Now some of the tax expenditures are good, they do good things, you probably couldn't get them repealed, you wouldn't want to. For instance, the deduction for charitable contributions, the charity does things that otherwise government would have to do. If a charitable hospital cut uh, was, was closed down, county general would have to be bigger and taxes would have to go up. So the advantage of granting a deduction for gifts to charity, uh, uh, the main one to me is, that the donor gets to pick who gets the money and not the government and not the Ways and Means Committee, that that really does democratize the tax system in a way that really you don't see very often. Other tax expenditures that are good, you, you couldn't or might not want to repeal them, exclusions from the sales tax for manufacturing equipment or exclusions from gross income for benefits you receive after retirement from Social Security. I think those are mainly untouchable. But even those need to come under review on a regular basis, just like everything that is an outright appropriation uh, would, would come to as well. And so if there's a new direction for loopholes and tax expenditures going forward, it would be, let's find other ways to do this. The ones that we have, let's control them and review them and uh, make sure that they operate like the rest of our tax system does. I was reading something about a guy in Toledo who is so obsessed with the fiscal cliff, that's all that he talks about. He, he lays tile and carpet. He's, in, he's uh, an employee of a business. He's driving his customers nutty. His bosses won't talk to him anymore. His family's moving out of Toledo where they live. Uh, so you do get caught up on things like this sometimes. And in fact, he says, you know, I, I really don't want the fiscal cliff thing to be resolved because then what am I going to talk about? He said, I like this even better. I haven't felt this good since we had the debate about increasing the debt ceiling. I don't think I want to be trapped in a corner with him at a Christmas party. I don't know about you. But uh, these are important aspects because of the dollars that are involved and because of the way that the tax expenditure budget evolves over time, we want to make sure that it fits what we're looking for. So there's a start to what our topic is today, uh, tax loopholes in Ohio and, and question mark, how should we close them? Um, Greg, I think this is a topic in the uh, State House right now. Maybe you can tell us what's going on there. No, absolutely. Uh, it, it is a very uh, hot topic. As a matter of fact, I was just over at the uh, <coughs> House Finance Committee and there was a piece of legislation that had a sponsor hearing today uh, on a committee to review tax expenditures uh, on an ongoing basis, a bipartisan committee, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's just one example. Uh, but a very big example came back, uh, the governor, uh, Governor Kasich, has made it very clear uh, that he is interested in tax reform. And that's a very, uh, a, you know, kind of an amorphous phrase, what is tax reform? And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but he made it very clear that he's looking at uh, some of these tax expenditures. We don't know exactly which ones and everything, but there's at least, uh, there's an examination there, uh, it, and it looks like uh, there may be some receptivity to, to modifications relative to the income tax. It's something he campaigned on when he ran for governor. Uh, it's something that he's had some other policy initiatives out discussing, uh, ways to try to make the Ohio income tax uh, less punitive. And as uh, Bill was saying, uh, one of the key things for, for tax reform is to make it a more rational process and to not have punitive taxes stay in place. Income taxes are sometimes in that sense. So that's something he's talking about, but it's opening up the door to a lot of other conversations. And a lot of uh, legislators seem to be interested in at least exploring this idea. Uh, and, and we, uh, the Buckeye Institute, uh, ha have been looking at this idea for a while and actually it brought us into a relationship with uh, what John is involved with, with the Center for Community Solutions. And uh, we kind of came up with sort of a joint idea that was out there last year uh, during the budget process and uh, to, to take a look at this in a more rigorous way. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> so let me give you a bit of uh, background on, on how we, we came to be here. So uh, during the pro budget process in uh, 2011, uh, our organization, which mainly deals with human service issues, uh, 
You're having a dialogue with the Buckeye Institute and, and also um, Greater Ohio um, Policy Center uh, about some things that were in the budget, and uh, uh, we found that you know, there are some things we disagreed about, but there was one, uh, one or two things we did agree about, and uh, this issue of tax expenditures and the review of tax expenditures was uh, one of those things that we thought that uh, we as research uh, and advocacy organizations need to bring to the attention uh, of the legislature. And so we came up with a proposal. Uh, this is during the budget process. I think the, uh, the, the bill itself was about ready to be passed out of the House at that time. We came up with a uh, proposal that, that had, uh, I think, three or four key elements uh, that, that we saw were, were necessary. Um, number one, uh, having a uh, new committee uh, in the legislature that would uh, specifically be there just to look at, ta at tax expenditures. Um, and uh, this would have uh, members from both the House and the Senate. Uh, it would be bipartisan. Uh, and this committee would, uh, its job would be basically to review uh, all of the existing uh, tax expenditures that are in the law right now but also to review uh, tax expenditures that have been proposed uh, so that there's a, an initial very thorough review um, at, at the outset and not just after something's been enacted. Another component which we thought was vital and is I think much, much harder uh, for people to get their head around was the idea of a sunset clause. In other words, that all of these tax expenditures, uh, unless they're you know, in the Constitution, uh, would be subject to a sunset clause and they would go away and we proposed uh, an eight-year cycle uh, that they would be enacted and after eight years unless the legislature uh, uh, agreed to reenact them that they you know these things would go away and we thought that was really necessary to kind of uh, concentrate people's minds on whether these things are achieving their uh, their intended purpose um, and we also thought that you know one of the problems we see out there is that um, it's not always clear after decades of being in, in the tax code why something's actually there. You can kind of tell it might, it might benefit a particular industry, a particular product, but there, there's really no metrics. You, know, you can't really tell if it's, if it's working or not. And so we thought for as these things get enacted, they needed to have with them some set of metrics so that eight years down the road or whenever you're taking a look, a look at it, you can actually tell is this working or not. Um, so we made our proposal. We made our rounds with uh, uh, leaders in the, in the legislature and, and in the administration, and uh, I think Greg can pick up a story from there. And there, was, there, was, there was definitely uh, interest uh, in, in the idea uh, of at least having the committee, uh, a committee that would look at this, a bipartisan committee made up of members of both uh, chambers. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was so much interest that uh, the Senate passed version of the budget bill actually included language, um, not, not exactly everything that, w that was out there in the, propo the joint proposal that we had, but at least in the creation of the committee and in the creation of a rotating examination of uh, these tax expenditures. There was also some uh, uh, language that was included that would take a look at some uh, criteria to find out what the efficacy uh, of those uh, tax expenditures were. Uh, obviously, uh, the, again, it came out of the Senate, uh, moved over, and for those of you uh, who are familiar with the legislative process, I see a few folks out there that are pretty familiar with the legislative process. Uh, you get it through the House, you get it through the Senate, uh, then typically uh, with a budget bill in particular, uh, the Senate version doesn't match the House version, it has to go to a conference committee, which is made up of members of both of the two main committees, the House and Senate Finance Committees. And uh, so they then review uh, the, bit, the two versions of the bill, and they come up with essentially a final version of the legislation. And it's that bill that comes out of the conference committee that, in fact, is what becomes the actual budget bill, the operating budget that the state does. Uh, in that process, uh, a lot of things can, can, can change. Uh, and in this case, uh, that particular provision related to the creation of this bipartisan committee was removed in the uh, conference committee. So when that final bill passed, out of that committee and then was taken back by both chambers, uh, it was not included, did not become a matter of law. And so that sort of opened the door 
uh, to uh, continuing conversations about whether or not uh, such a committee and an examination of these tax expenditures uh, should continue. There, there's, there's been a number of uh, you know, committees, uh, Senate Ways and Means has had some uh, work on this. There's been a, there was actually a traveling committee uh, by the Ohio House of Representatives last year that spent a good chunk of time going around the state. It was chaired by uh, Representative John Adams. Uh, and they, I forget the exact number of hearings that they had, uh, but, but it was numerous, uh, again, around the state. Uh, taking a look at taxes in general, one of the issues that they looked at, uh, one of the main issues was, again, tax expenditures. So this kind of goes back to reinforce the notion that there is uh, an understanding uh, amongst many legislators that this is an issue that, that needs to be looked at. Uh, for uh, a myriad of different uh, uh, different reasons. And uh, there's obviously been a couple of uh, pieces of legislation that kind of pick up where things were left off uh, after the budget process last year. And uh, John? Uh, very, so very briefly, uh, Greg was mentioning one of the bills that received its uh, hearing this morning. That was House Bill 446. Uh, Representatives Treehouse and Foley are the primary sponsors there. Um, very similar concept with a review uh, committee. Um, a little bit different makeup, but um, you know, very focused on the concept of, of evaluation. Um, another uh, bill that was introduced not too long ago was Representative Boos. Uh, it was very similar to the uh, language that, uh, that uh, we had uh, recommended for the Senate version, although I should say that neither of those two bills have a sunset clause, uh, but they still uh, uh, would be important steps forward. Uh, we're supportive of those. So we have some examples for you here today for you to consider of uh, different uh, uh, tax expenditures that are in the Ohio tax law. And we wanted to throw a few of them out there uh, for you to consider and, and uh, just talk about how they're, uh, how they're working and, and how one might review them and uh, just to get the conversation started. So, you know, Greg and I were talking with Bill and we thought, you know, what, what are we going to do to, you know, wake people up over, over lunch? So let's get a, let's get a, uh, a juicy one. So I think you know, I'll start off with the one I think we can have a little bit of fun with. Um, uh, House Bill 519, back in June of 2010, uh, created the Ohio Casino Control Commission uh, and a regulatory framework for casinos. And uh, also at that time, it created a tax deduction for gambling losses. Um, and uh, it did not become effective right away. Uh, and it was really uh, a tied to the you know, c construction of the casinos, but uh, it w it's becomes active in tax year 2013. And so people can start to claim it when they're filing uh, in 2014. Um, so uh, it is tied to, there is an existing uh, uh, deduction of that type in federal law and al already there uh, in which a person uh, can take an itemized deduction for gambling losses. Now it's not for everybody. You actually have to keep records of your of your betting. Okay, and it's not just casinos. It, it can apply to uh, racetracks, lottery, kino, bingo. Uh, and uh, if you're going to use that, you also have to keep a, a diary actually of when you are actually at the casino or the racetrack what, what time it was, even, you know, some of the guidance talks about who you were, who you were with at that time, okay? Now, so there's, there's a paperwork burden, so that your, uh, your casual gambler may not be using that. Uh, on the other hand, I, I learned this when I was uh, uh, looking into, into this, if someone is a professional gambler, then they actually file like a, a small business and use a Schedule C on the federal form, and, and the IRS, because of a court case, actually did have to uh, recognize people who are full-time professional gamblers as being uh, small businesses. Um, so, you know, so here we are with a, a, a new uh, deduction that's, that's in the law. Um, the, uh, the fiscal estimates on this from the LSC uh, estimates at the time uh, it was passed were the losses would be in the tens of millions. They didn't put an exact figure on it. Um, Tom Suttis, who writes for the Plain Dealer, um, put a figure of $40 million that he got from his sources, uh, whoever they were. So it's expected to be sizable. And the idea here, presumably, uh, you know, based on some of the comments that were made at the time, is that um, some of the other states are offering this, and we need to make sure that Ohio is, you know, turning into that you know, premier uh, destination for people who want to wager and, and, and uh, become 
um, you know, not we're not losing people to other states, and that you know that was one of the main uh, discussion points at, at, at the time the uh, casino issue was on the ballot. Um, so, how would one evaluate this? I think you know one could ask a number of of the questions. Obviously, we need, you'd probably need a year or two of experience to see who's filing and uh, who's not. Uh, but we need to put it in the context of uh, what is the you know the economic development uh, effect of of the uh, casinos and the other forms of uh, of gambling we have in the in the state. What is the multiplier effect? Uh, are we able to go a year or two from now out on the hilltop and look at the uh, neighborhood out there and see significant revitalization or not? And I think after a couple of years we'll be able to tell that. But from a, a tax perspective. Um, you know, you might be, the tax department would probably be able to tell you what the income level is of some of the people who are using this uh, deduction. It's going to be higher because it's going to be mostly people who, uh, who itemize on their taxes. Are, they, are these going to be the high rollers? I don't know if people use that term anymore, but the um, tax department might be able to tell you the, uh, the, the county that these folks live in. Are we able to say that it's mostly uh, the big urban counties that have a casino, or is it uh, some of the rural counties, and, and uh, what would that tell you about where people are, are traveling? Um, and then I think one would look at, uh, uh, you can get some public information about how many people from other states, I think the casinos keep track of people coming in from other states, and um, some of the casinos in surrounding states can tell you, well, we've had so many visitors from Ohio. You know, I think you'd have to take this all into account and um, and uh, try to figure out you know this what is, is this deduction getting some uh, extra value for the, for the state in terms of tax revenue or economic development uh, uh, or if not and uh, you know ultimately the question about all of these tax expenditures what what are our priorities is it more important to do this uh, type of subsidy essentially for gambling than it is to do the all the other things that the state does whether that's education or human services or transportation um, so I think that, you know, that's one that we should be watching, and I, I think it'll be interesting to, uh, to see how that develops. Greg, do you want to come out with one of your favorite examples? Well, there's actually kind of an interesting one uh, just to take a look at. And this is an example of raising the question. Um, this is why you might want to review it and ask, what is the public policy implication here? Uh, everybody, you know, you get uh, exemptions, obviously, uh, in uh, for your individual exemptions in your state income tax, uh, and so you have that. But did uh, you also get a $20 credit for each of the exemptions that you take uh, on, in your personal income tax on the state? So you're essentially, it's it's actually over about $160 million a year in foregone revenue in $20 tax credits that you can actually take. And it's actually here in the. Uh, I, this is actually a. This is not blue. I had it printed off. It's black and white here. But this is the actual tax expenditure report, uh, which is uh, how you can look at each individual tax expenditure. Uh, and you can look at the approximate uh, number of revenue that's uh, foregone uh, as a result of the, ex of the uh, credit or exemption deduction, what have you. Uh, this is done every year as part of the biennial budget process. It comes out with the governor's blue book and looking at the, all these other the state operating budget. It's a very interesting read. It's only 50-something pages long. Uh, it's not too bad. Uh, compared to a lot of government documents, it is amazingly small, which uh, I, I think is actually to its, uh, to its benefit. And it's, it's pretty simple and, and, and straightforward. Uh, but yeah, it's very interesting. And it's Revised Code 5747022. It was actually enacted in 1983. And the taxpayer may claim a $20 credit for each personal exemption that is claimed. Uh, so there's an example of something that, not necessarily saying that that should be one that's not that's taken off the table, but it's a, an example of how you have this myriad of different types of exemptions and credits that are literally throughout the entire tax code. John, okay, another, this one will get people. Uh, I think this one will get certain people very excited. Well, uh, well, I hope so. So uh, we just com concluded a uh, a uh, political campaign, right, uh, for a number of different offices and. Uh, Quite a, uh, a great deal of money was spent uh, to buy TV ads and, uh, and other forms of advertising, as we all know, for candidates uh, to get, get the word out. Um, so uh, one of the uh, credits that is in the law today is a political contribution credit in the state tax code for uh, contributions to basically state offices, so governor, lieutenant governor, um, House of Representatives, Senate, uh, 
uh, all, all the major state offices, auditor, treasurer. So it's $50, uh, up to $50 for a person, uh, $100 for a married couple. And, you know, so the interesting question is here, you know, uh, who's using this? Is it really a uh, necessary inducement? Is, is it, is, how do we think about this? Is it a reward? Uh, you've you've uh, participated in the political process, so we'll give you a, a tax credit. Well, maybe we should. Um, it's sort of a, an interesting thing about uh, the revenue loss is about $5 million. And actually, I looked into a little bit of the recent history, and the number of people using it is, has gone up. Uh, there are about 73,000 people claimed it uh, in, uh, in 2010. Uh, so here's another one. I think it would be very interesting to see the uh, legislature review this and try to figure out, um, you know, what, what is its usefulness, what is its purpose. Uh, and I think you could look at it from all sorts of different, uh, different angles. Greg, maybe you have one more. Uh, well, here, here's one that keeps popping up an awful lot, sometimes in the press, and again, I kind of make reference to uh, the hearing this morning, it came up, one of the sponsors of the uh, legislation was uh, uh, talking about this one, and they were kind of scratching their head uh, a, a little bit uh, on it, and again, uh, this is just an example of the kind of things that are in the code. This isn't saying that this should or should not necessarily be there, it's just an example of taking a look and making sure that we have the process to examine it. But uh, in, o uh, in Ohio, you can now actually get, there's an $800 tax cap on uh, sales tax for fractionally owned aircraft uh, here in the state. So essentially, uh, you, you have a max out of $800 uh, if you have uh, uh, buying a jet, a private jet basically in Ohio, uh, and it's what they actually end up doing is if you have a fraction of it, you can pay whatever the percentage of that $800 amount is. So if you've got five people that are in it, or eight people for simplicity's sake, who have uh, an equal ownership of this jet, uh, they would each pay $100 in sales tax uh, based upon whatever uh, that portion there. Now, th it is somewhat limited. Uh, there's actually, I believe, only a couple of companies in the state that actually uh, uh, operate a program uh, that actually offers fractional ownership of, of jets. It doesn't apply if you buy the whole thing. This exemption doesn't, or this cap on the sales tax doesn't apply. Uh, so it is a somewhat limited one. And in fact, it doesn't actually generate all that, but, or there's not a lot of lost revenue. It's approximately a million dollars in each fiscal year. So it is, again, an extremely limited one. But it raises, again, the question of uh, this was put into place back in 2003. It's a relatively new one, uh, and it is one of those that uh, just makes folks go, well, what are tax expenditures? What are we spending it on? And keep circling back to that notion of having a robust and rigorous way of looking at these expenditures on an ongoing basis to make sure these things are uh, achieving the goals uh, that they were intended to achieve. Well, we're getting close to the time where we'll start taking questions. If you have a tax expenditure or a tax loophole you'd like to protect uh, we'll get rid of. or expand or see someone else's cut back, uh, get ready to line forms here. And uh, we'll, we'll start with that in a few minutes. But let me ask one more question before we do that. Um, Greg, why don't you go first? We save all this money by cutting back on tax loopholes or, or reviewing and then revising tax expenditures. What are you going to do with that money? Well, and that's one of the things. We, we, when we came together with Greater Ohio and Center for Community Solutions last year, uh, we were interested in looking at the process through which tax expenditures are looked at and, and having that done. But the agreement does not extend necessarily to the use of any revenue that's generated that way. The Buckeye Institute is a real free market think tank based here in Columbus. We believe in low taxes, low regulations. Uh, so we think that's the best way to incentivize, to create a vibrant private sector, which is what we all want to see here in Ohio. Um, the Buckeye Institute, if you're going to close some loopholes, if you're going to do that, that means revenue is going to come into the system. I kind of uh, probably previewed this a bit in my earlier comments by saying that we want a less distorting tax code, we want a more efficient tax code, and we want, quite frankly, lower taxes overall so that we have a tax code that's able to make people come here. There's a lot of literature out there uh, that looks at how, what you can do. There's the, how many of you are familiar with the Laffer Curve? And the amount of, uh, there's a few there. It's a, it's a wonderful little thing. If anybody's got a napkin, you can draw the little parabola curve on there. And the concept is essentially there's a, there's a point 
uh, where you, uh, th that if you tax too much, you're going to, in fact, be losing revenue rather than gaining revenue. Uh, it's kind of amazing, but that, that concept has not necessarily made its way as, as much through the population maybe as it, as it needs to, so people can understand that that's a, a key economic concept. We certainly think that uh, uh, tax uh, cuts and getting our tax code in a better uh, position for overall competitiveness would be the way to, uh, to move forward. I'll, I'll take up that question as well. As Greg said, this is an issue where we don't always uh, see eye to eye. My organization uh, studies human services, and uh, we can certainly sit here uh, uh, the rest of the afternoon, and I can identify uh, human service programs where if we made some additional investment, we would uh, not only be helping people, but saving money in the long run. Uh, you know, for example, you know, the, our state, like the rest of American society, faces uh, so-called aging tsunami as the baby boomer generation uh, ages, and you're going to need uh, more revenue to take care of folks and do it in a smart way by helping them stay at home rather than going to a nursing home, uh, uh, as long, for, keep them at home as long as they can. Uh, I can point you to, you know, mental health services or um, drug and alcohol addiction services where we are woefully, woefully underinvested and uh, some additional uh, uh, revenue directed to those areas I think would keep um, people out of a lot of trouble and, and the economy would be better as well. With that said, I think, you know, deciding what to do with the revenue needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. What, what policy objective are we, are we looking at? You know, one of the points I want to leave you with is that sometimes uh, the legislature accomplishes or tries to accomplish something on the, on the revenue side of the budget through these tax expenditures. At the same time, we're often running programs on the spending side. And so we need to do a better job of figuring out how these two, uh, these two things uh, fit together. Um, one, one example of that is that we have a, um, a deduction for uh, contributions to uh, 529 accounts to save for uh, kids' college. Uh, and, uh, you know, so on, what is the relationship between that and the actual funding stream that goes into our colleges and universities? How does that fit together? Um, how do we reduce the, uh, uh, the amount of debt that some of our students have to, have to take on? So these are, these are often difficult questions, um, but uh, we do want to bring them to your attention and uh, uh, ask for your support as we uh, try to move this uh, concept through the legislature. Well, let's move to our question period. Uh, I'm not promising we're going to have answers. We will have a question period. And um, we, uh, we want you to know that uh, CMC records all of the forums for broadcast on YouTube. I hope you uh, wore your best clothes today. Streaming on CMC's website. It also streams on the website of the Metropolitan Library. When you ask your question, identify yourself. And please, no preaching. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. Thank you for your comments. Today's program was advertised as $7 billion in tax loopholes. I've been keeping count here. We're far short of that. Would you please identify some of the, you know, several of the largest tax expenditures that get us closer to that $7 billion? Well, there are, there are a number. About $5 billion of those are actually in the sales tax uh, alone. Uh, and so if you're going to do serious loophole closing, that's where you'd have to look. Now, some of the largest are, um, uh, as Bill pointed out, I think, in his opening remarks for various types of business equipment and machinery. I think the largest single one is, is sales tax exemption on capital equipment and related things for business. Uh, and I don't, Greg may be looking at his book here. I think it's around $2 billion just for that one alone. I mean, Ohio's still a major manufacturing state. Now, you may not want to touch that one. And, you know, so I'm not up here saying that we would ever get close to closing $7 billion worth of loopholes. But you would want to evaluate it. You might want to tweak it. You might want to say, you know, this, this ter certain kind of machinery maybe doesn't fit in it. But, you know, I th I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I think we'd all understand the topic better if we knew what the biggest categories of tax loopholes were, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. Some of the manufacturing equipment, that, that, that's certainly one of them. There's also sales tax exemptions on, on food and things like that. 
Uh, and, I mean, there, those, those are, are a couple of the very large ones. I'm actually trying to get the exact amount there. But when you're looking at that, those are going to get you uh, in the several billion out of that seven billion in, in, in those areas. So uh, as John was saying, uh, one of the things here is that there, there are some purposes here. I mean, you've, you've got exemptions for pharmacy uh, uh, for uh, drugs. You've got uh, retirement uh, issues where uh, retirement benefits. I mean, these are uh, things that probably in, in, in many cases are sacrosanct and actually do also some of those that are sacrosanct are also fairly significant in numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, you're right. The 7.6, it, it, it would seem unlikely that you're going to generate anything near that. But when you start looking at some of the smaller ones and the myriad of them, that's where you could perhaps get several hundred million to a billion or something in that range. Uh, and, all. And, and having a review process allows us to have a more open, transparent way of going about and doing that and having the ability to look and uh, at what their, their uh, purposes are. But to, to answer that question, yes, there are some that are just that are very, very large, and typically the manufacturing and some of those are some of the largest single ones that you'll have uh, that that's, uh, takes up a ton. Thank you. So roughly the sales tax and the income tax yield the same amount of revenue r roughly from year to year, but the exemptions are skewed toward the sales and use tax. Hi, gentlemen. My name is Andy Campbell. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm wondering if an uncollected tax is a tax expenditure, and I'm referring specifically to Internet sales tax, potentially how many tax scoff laws we have in the state of Ohio, and what kind of dollars we might be talking about there. Are you looking for a raising of the hands here? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to raise mine, but... <laughs> After Cyber Monday, I bet it's pretty close to 100%. Uh, wh what do you do with something like that? It's a law on the books that is, let's say generously, not being enforced by the state. Collecting Internet sales taxes. Well, there's one uh, point of view that, that really uh, that issue has to be solved at the federal level. And so the, the way the law works is basically a, a physical retailer that has a physical location in Ohio has to collect the sales tax and remit it to the state. Uh, an entity like Amazon that may, you know, doesn't have a physical location is not doing that. And so there's a lot of discussion on the federal level of whether um, you know, uh, the law should be changed to force uh, an entity like Amazon to collect sales tax on behalf of the state and remit. Because right now it's, it's, uh, based, it's almost on an honor system that uh, you know, there's actually a line on the uh, Ohio personal income tax return where you're supposed to um, voluntarily uh, pay the tax and and yet we know that you know there's not uh, a great deal of compliance with that shall we say but um, you know it's it is it is a tough issue that that may be one that we have to deal with at the federal level John I think you just questioned the integrity of every citizen of the state of Ohio you uh, <laughs> watch your back when you uh, go out this afternoon but uh, some of the states have been aggressive in working with Amazon and striking deals with them and trying to collect the tax uh, almost on an ad hoc basis. Ohio has not yet gotten into that as far as I know. Uh, my name is Liz Hickson and when you mentioned politics I thought of the super PACs and I especially I'm a fan of Comedy Central late night. Stephen Colbert started his own super PAC. So what happens to that money? Can he give that back to his donors, or can he contribute it to a charity? What happens to that money? I, I, well, I, I don't. Uh, I don't believe in that particular case that the, uh, the the money that would go to super PACs it would not be what fell under the particular exemption that that's uh, or the credit that's here in Ohio. Uh, those are those are explicitly ones that go to specific candidates, and in fact, they don't apply to federal, they don't apply to PACs at any level, whether it's federal or state, or, or to federal uh, candidates. Um, but it is an interesting question. I had forgotten that he actually had, had created one of those. It might make for, uh, 2014, 2016 even more entertaining than what we just went through, right? I think Pat Paulson still had some money left in his campaign funds, <laughs> uh, but uh, they outlived him, didn't they? Uh, the way I understand the law, just, just as an overview, uh, he could give the money to another PAC, he could give it to other candidates or campaigns, uh, or to charity. But, uh, but uh, you don't see that happen too often. He'll probably be back. My name is Dan Navin with the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. Um, among the many questions I have, I'll just focus on one. And that is, if you're going to do 
the analysis that is contemplated by both speakers uh, since the basic premise or presumption of, of doing it in the first place is that it's costing governments, local, go local and state, uh, revenue. Uh, I would submit that that is looking at just one side of the equation and that you have to do some sort of dynamic analysis that tries to develop what maybe are some of the competitive or equity type reasons for enacting the provisions, whether it's an exemption or a deduction or a credit in the first place. And that is going to entail a pretty significant infrastructure of researchers and other types of people to help in developing the data that will be necessary to do this. Can either of the speakers speak to that issue? Uh, no, absolutely. Thanks for the question because that's a very important one. And one of the reasons that that we have an eight that, that, that the proposal had an eight year cycle. There's um, and one of the pieces of legislation that's out there right now. It essentially would be every two years you'd be looking at all of them. Uh, every year you'd look at half, and 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 that's not particularly realistic probably uh, in terms of what, what's feasible to do because uh, if you're going to be fair, if you're going to look at it, you've got to look at all kinds of things like the intent of the legislature when they looked at it, you've got to go back and, and make sure that that's constantly looked at and, and reaffirmed and understood in a complete sense. But you're right, there's also when you do certain exemptions that are intended for job creation, there's other taxes that are actually cr that are essentially there because you have people paying taxes uh, through the jobs that they now have and things like that. So in essence, I get the sense it would be a, a more they kind of call it dynamic scoring in Washington and that's sort of the, the inside phrasing that's used. But I think that you would probably, it would be difficult to do, I think that uh, that it would take a certain degree of, of expertise to do this on an ongoing basis. Uh, but having a committee that would be established to do that and to build up that expertise would be one of the ways in which you could do that. But yes, you're going to have to look at it uh, in, a, in a very complex way, in a to total way, and that means you've got to look at not just the foregone revenue, but the, any revenue that's generated that way uh, through, again, the creation of jobs and various other things, if that's the case. Uh, or, in some cases, some of them maybe aren't job creation. Some of those exemptions, like the, the personal one that I mentioned earlier or things of that nature, uh, those are those are public policy decisions uh, that are made uh, outside of just pure economic uh, uh, choices. And so, you know, there's going to always be the debate and the conversation about that when you have this or this committee looked at, uh, looking at those kind of things. But you, you, you've got to do it that way. Uh, that's why you have to have the right appropriate amount of time as people look at this, uh, is to assure that we are not shortchanging that analytic process to, to look at them so that when decisions are made on keeping, not keeping, whatever, uh, people can feel that it really has been transparent, honest, straightforward, and effective. Just to add one, one brief comment. Um, a few years ago, I remember looking at uh, some studies that were done of uh, economic development, tax credits, and incentives in Michigan. And there were like three or four different studies I looked at, and they all purported to be doing some sort of analysis of the efficiency and, and uh, you know, value of these programs, and some of them were using dynamic analysis. Well, they all reached different conclusions, and I think that's, um, your point is well taken. I think the issue is can we uh, come to agreement on what is a common methodology that would be acceptable to all sides, so to speak, and then you could invest in, there are, you know, economic uh, tools like Remy and some of the other programs you could use that, it, but, you know, could you get to the point where everyone agrees that this is a fair, the baseline you're using is fair, the, the, assum the assumptions are so critical in those types of analyses, are, are the assumptions that, that the analysis, uh, the analyst is using, are, are those the right assumptions, but, you know, um, as long as those, on the other hand, as long as those assumptions are laid out and, and discussed openly, then at least you can have that dialogue and you can begin to have uh, an evaluation, which is, uh, in most cases, more than what we have now. Knowing yet that taxes are more subject to the law of unintended consequences than any part of society, as far as I can see. So, so even then, um, we'll, we'll have to see what the results are. One last one. Yeah, Gene Krebs. Hi, guys. And just sort of, um, uh, you can respond to this. There is one tax credit that is for the state historic tax credit for preservation. Uh, that in order to apply for it, you have to first do a cost-benefit analysis. Half the applications fail. 
So my question for you is that type of model, the model that you would suggest the state tend to look at more aggressively for this, or would you suggest some sort of a different model? This is one that goes on before, and I think right now, I think that the return on investment for the state, I think is eight to one for every uh, dollar of credit invested in that. Well, Gene, I, I would say for um, large tax credits um, of that nature, you know, involving real estate development or so, some sort of large economic development project to the extent that we can uh, build in evaluation and a cost-benefit analysis up front rather than trying to go back years later and figure it out, figure it out. I think that would, um, it would avoid some uh, worst-case scenarios and uh, it would also probably uh, uh, forces people to come in with a better application because they know it's going to be evaluated so you know they ha they have to show that return on investment and I think uh, you know that's what we need to be doing more of at the state level thinking of these things as you know almost like an investment banker what what is the return on this project as, as opposed to some other uh, alternative use of money it would certainly be something that, that that would should be considered I think too on the, the larger ones in particular you have an issue where you, you really want to be certain that you're getting something right on the very uh, front end. Well, very good. Thank you to the panel for your comments and to all of you for your attention and for your questions and for spending some time talking about taxes. Thanks a lot. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's forum. Uh, in fact, you can see it again on YouTube. And you can also share it with folks on YouTube through a link on the CMC's website. Uh, please remember to make reservations for our forum next week featuring Jim Grote and Jane Grote Abel of Donato's. And I want to invite you to continue today's conversation outside for over some cookies and coffee. And once more, let's thank our sponsor today, GBQ Partners. And thank you again to our speakers, John Hennick and Greg Lawson, and our moderator, William Robbie. Thank you all, and thanks for coming. Appreciate it.